The subject is, what is a Christian? And I am anticipating that you're going to address that and talk to us about what a Christian is, but I was wondering if maybe it would be good for us, before you talk about what a Christian is, to talk a little bit about what a Christian is not. Sometimes it makes it clearer. Well, it came as a big surprise to me to find out that a Christian is not someone who simply does what is right. Um, my dad used to say to me, uh, remember son, it always, always pays to do what's right and it never, never pays to do what's wrong. And I would say to myself, well, thanks a lot, dad. What else is new? Uh, <laughs> why don't you tell me how to go about that? But uh, emphasis on doing what is right as a basis for Christianity is a misunderstanding. Well, now that just gave me, as I heard you say that, that just gave me a whole new understanding of something that uh, you said to me the first time I went to summer camp. <laughs> as we were driving all the way from our home several hours to go to summer camp at Camp Wawona, you were taking me up from my first trip to Camp Wawona. You don't know what I'm going to say next, do you? Mom was doing the mom thing. I think it's the same thing all moms do. I married a mom, so I, I know that moms keep doing that. But um, as we were driving to camp, mom kept saying things to me like, now remember to brush your teeth after each meal. And I would say, yes, mom. And uh, we get a little closer to camp. She'd say, now, I want you to make sure you wash your hair when they give you those times to take a shower, wash your hair too. Don't just get in there and run around and then get out and say you took a shower. And uh, be sure to eat all the food that you're given. Don't eat more than one helping of dessert. Um, change your underwear. What is it about mothers that always want us changing our underwear? And uh, boy, those things just kept going and going. And, and mom kept telling me what, what to be careful about and what to avoid. Make sure you stay out of the poison oak and watch for the rattlesnakes. And you just sort of drove the car. Um, <laughs> But as you dropped me off and put my suitcases down in front of that cabin, I'll never forget, and I guess I was probably 10 years old, you said to me, George, nickname you gave me, which I've never cared for. <laughs> you said to me, George, whatever you do, don't be too good. You said that. I did. Don't be too good. Now, I don't think you were saying that I shouldn't obey my counselor, but I think even clear back then, you had a healthy dose from your dad about do what's right, do what's right, do what's right. And you were telling me, I'm not saying to be bad, but don't be so concerned about good behavior that it, it ruins your whole trip here at camp. What about being religious? <clears throat> I read a book by Fritz Ridner, um, How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. Is that uh, something that we need to consider? How to be a Christian without being religious. Well, what is religious? It seems to me that uh, many people think that they're Christians because they go to church each week or because maybe they um, are kind to the neighbor or they take out the trash without griping or they don't cheat on their income tax. And, 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 and because they do those good, they don't do those bad things and, and are trying hard to do the good things, that, that makes them religious and the church attendance is the important thing and so they're okay. And, and you're saying that there's a book about how to be a Christian without being religious? What's, what's Fritz doing with that? Well, as I recall, he was trying to point out that simply going through the forms, the routine of religion is not uh, Christianity. And uh, that being a real Christian will deliver us from that. Going through the forms. So sitting in a, in a church <clears throat> once a week doesn't make me a Christian. <clears throat> in Matthew 7, I think there are some people who appear very religious. They uh, cast out devils and prophesy and uh, do many wonderful things. And then uh, God says, I never knew you. I think that uh, Jesus told at least three parables like that, didn't he? Where groups of people are apparently at the judgment 
bar or whatever, looking for entrance into the heavenly country. And um, they kind of go down this recitation of the good things they've done and, and, and are told that you don't get in here for that reason. I was just imagining, suppose you'd just come back from um, uh, a mission trip where you'd built a church or a school for somebody. And as you were getting out of the airplane, Jesus was, was at, the, at the gate and you walked up to him thinking, boy, I sure, he sure caught me at a good moment. You know, I'm just coming back from this mission trip. And he said to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. It seemed like that'd be a puzzling thing to hear from him. And yet that's what he told these people who had just got done saying that they've done good things. So it's not about what you do. Well, Christianity is not based on what you do. It's based on who you know, apparently. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the right, mm -hmm. the right people. So getting into heaven is a lot like uh, getting into a, a club where if you know the right people and have connections, they're going to let you in. <laughs> it's who you know. It's who you know. It sounds political, but uh, it's still who you know. <laughs> seems like I've read a book that was entitled, It's Who You Know. <laughs> know the author. <laughs> Have you heard the story about the man who went to heaven and uh, he wanted to get in and Peter said, that we're on the point system, you need 100 points. No. And uh, he said, well, I uh, was a faithful husband and father for 40 years. And Peter said, well, we'll give you uh, two points. For two that. points for that. And he said, two points. And he scratched his head and he said, uh, well, I was a deacon in the church and uh, did faithful deacon work. In the, uh, and Peter says, uh, oh, one point for that. <laughs> one point. It's going and he's down. getting desperate now. Yeah. He says, uh, I worked with, with a, you know, helping people who were without food and clothes. So I helped them, and Peter said, that's one half point. <laughs> and the man exploded. He says, hey, the only way I'd get in here would be by the grace of God. And Peter said, welcome in. <laughs> <laughs> and are you willing to give up your three and a half points? I am. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that brings me to maybe one last question I'd like to ask before you tell us uh, what a Christian is. If I don't go to heaven for being good, if being good is not the basis for my going to heaven, would it be fair to say that if I'm lost one day, I, I will never be lost for being bad? Yeah, I think if the first is true, so is the second. If our good deeds and our obedience have nothing to do with saving us in heaven, then our bad deeds and our disobedience have nothing to do with causing us to be lost. There's only one reason I'm lost, because I don't know Jesus. And the bad deeds are the result of that. All right. Put it together for us this, this evening. And if I get to heaven, I, uh, it'll be only because I know Jesus, and the good deeds are the result of that. Well, tell us more about Jesus. There are a group of press people who... <coughs> went to the street corners in Chicago several years ago, and they asked the man on the street, what is a Christian? They wanted to go back and report their findings to their popular news magazine. And they uh, kept track of the answers, and all of the answers were behavioral answers. The name of Jesus, was not even mentioned. So a Christian is one who does what is right. Or a Christian is one who uh, is nice to the neighbors. Or a Christian is one who lives by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this was a startling revelation. These are not uh, all people of one denomination. These are people of different faiths and of no faith. And they all had the same idea that Christianity is uh, a behavioral 
thing. Well, I uh, read about that and I went to my parish. I had just uh, moved to a new church parish as a pastor. So I went around to all of my church members and visited them in their homes. And after we had talked about uh, son and daughter and the pictures on the mantle and the canary and the dog and the cat, I asked them all the same question. What is a Christian? And to my surprise, nine out of 10 defined Christianity in terms of behavior. In my own church, this was a startling <clears throat> revelation. Because if this is my idea of what a Christian is, it's going to have a big influence on my entire Christian life. And one of the biggest things that comes with it is uncertainty, uncertainty. My boy did this in the academy, high school years. Asked the uh, students what a Christian was and they gave again behavior answers. And then when he said, uh, if Jesus was to come tonight, would you be ready? Would you be saved? And they said, no way. Why? Because I am failing, falling and failing. So it influences the problem of assurance and certainty in the Christian life. Well, how did the term Christian come about? You read about it in Acts 11, verse 26, where it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Why were they called Christians? Can you guess? It's because uh, that's all they could talk about. Christ did this, Christ went there, Christ was this. Uh, it was all Christ, Christ, Christ. And the people said, well, why don't we call them Christians? That's where they got their name. And uh, according to a little book that I read one time called Steps to Christ, there are two ways by which I can be sure of whether or not I'm a genuine follower of Christ. Of whom do I love to think, and of whom do I love to talk? I have talked with parents who were discouraged because uh, they brought up their children in the church and in the church school, and their children have left the faith. And they say, uh, I don't understand it, because they know it. They know it. They learned it in Sabbath school. They learned it in church. They learned it in church school. They know it. Big clue. Doesn't have to do with it. It has to do with whom. Of whom do you love to think? And of whom do you love to talk? And the big question is, did those young people hear their parents talking about Jesus? Or just about again? It. So these are two big tests that we can ask ourselves, even here tonight. Of whom do I love to think? And of whom do I love to talk? Now I'd like to remind you that a Christian is one who has accepted John 3.16. John 3.16. I remember when the new versions of the Bible began coming out. And a great radio preacher that you may know about was very discouraged and unhappy about the new versions. The Revised Standard Version, he called the Revised Standard Perversion. <laughs> and he didn't like it. But then he said, on second thought, really the only thing a person needs to be saved is that one text, John 3.16. That's enough. That'll do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, believeth, a better word is trusteth in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. So a Christian is one who has accepted a belief and a trust in Jesus, which indicates relationship, and is also planning on eternal life. Well, if they're planning on eternal life, how do you get there? And this is where we have a big clue in John 17, verse 3, where it tells us that this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Amen. Knowing him is the way we get 
to heaven and the way we experience eternal life. It's who you know that counts. Uh, perhaps you heard about the lady who was stopped by the police officer. And uh, as he looked at her license, he said, where are your glasses? She said, I have contacts. He said, I don't, know, I don't care who you know. I want to know where your glasses are. <laughs> And uh, this is a very significant question to ask concerning faith and eternal life. Well, I went off to uh, college and there were <clears throat> three things that I had wanted to be. I wanted to be either a cowboy or a jazz drummer or a preacher. <laughs> they were only teaching one of them there at La Sierra. <clears throat> So I uh, signed up for uh, the ministry, studied to be a minister. The first week in registration, the upperclassmen had a big influence on us. I remember one of the upperclassmen said to me, uh, why don't you put a blade in the razor next time? And another one said, you could stand a little closer to the razor when you shave. And so I began to shave more than once a week. And then they said to me, there is a class that you need to take here on the life of Christ. I said, I've taken that kind of class before. I have memorized his journeys, his miracles, his parables. I have been over that ground. No, they said, take this class by this particular teacher. I said, why? They said, just do it. But I need to know why I'm supposed to do it. And they said, do it. In other words, shut up and eat your mush. Um, and I was impressed by them enough to sign up for that class. I went to the class and I uh, <clears throat> took a paper and pen and was ready to take notes and feed those notes back to the teacher at the end of the quarter. But we found out that we don't take notes in this class. Nobody did. He never asked us to memorize any texts or parables or miracles or journeys. All he did was get up and talk about Jesus. He loved to talk about Jesus. Apparently he had been doing a lot of thinking about Jesus. I didn't know there was that much to say about Jesus, but he went on and on every day and our hearts were strangely warmed. He loved to talk about how Jesus treated people. And we came to the conclusion that if Jesus could treat people the way he did, there must be a chance for us. After his class, instead of running to the gym to throw baskets or going to the cafeteria to eat, we'd find ourselves walking across the campus or sitting down on a bench and thinking about Jesus. It was a phenomenal experience. I've never forgotten that. But the course was finished and we went on to other more important things like Greek, and U.S. government. Oh, I'd rather read the telephone book. <laughs> Important topics and subjects that we were supposed to have in a liberal arts education. And I found that my class time with him faded away. I graduated and went into the uh, ministry. And I can still remember my first church in Sacramento a little church on the south side of Sacramento. There was a godly woman there who would listen carefully while I preached. Now I was preaching sermons that I borrowed from other people. I borrowed from my dad, my uncle, from uh, D.L. Moody, from Charles Spurgeon, from uh, Bunch and from uh, different <clears throat> good preachers. And uh, I never had really much to say myself. And I uh, thought about it one day, our homiletics teacher had told us <clears throat> that uh, don't be like the man who did that. He had a well-read woman in his audience and every time he'd say something, she'd say that was Moody. And then he'd say something else, that was Spurgeon. And it just irked him. And one day he couldn't take it any longer and he said, shut up. And she said, that's you. 
That was the first original thing that he had said. And I found myself in that trap. And uh, she picked up on it. And one day she met me at the door after church and she thanked me for my sermon. She was very nice. And then she said this, it'll be a wonderful day when you get to know Jesus. Ouch. I didn't know whether to love her or hate her. The painful thing is that uh, it was true. I would go back and I would try again and several weeks later she'd need me at the door. She was always kind, she smiled, shook my hand. It'll be a wonderful day when you get to know Jesus. And it was good for me. Sometimes congregations don't realize how much good they can do the preacher. It's a two-way thing. Not just preacher helping congregation, congregation helping the preacher. Well, about that time, we had a general conference in San Francisco. I went to the general conference, and there in the auditorium, there were 10,000 delegates inside and 10,000 people wandering around outside in the halls. And as I was wandering around in the crowd, suddenly I came face to face with my old Bible teacher. And we began talking, and we hadn't been talking for 30 seconds, and he was talking again about Jesus. And a flood of memories came back about our hearts being warmed in his class. And I had to find a, a stairwell underneath which I could weep as I remembered what that class had meant to me. And I said to myself, uh, where does he get that? Are there some people born with uh, their brain over on the right side of their head? Uh, are there some people who are born mystics? Where does he get that? I already knew where he got that. He spent time alone every day in personal fellowship and seeking of Jesus. He spent time in the Gospels, the New Testament. He spent time in a famous book called Desire of Ages, a classic on the life of Christ. And I said to myself, uh, I guess the same thing is available for me. And I began to seek Jesus through his word and through prayer and discovered that I didn't have to depend upon a class at college. It could be a living thing day by day. But as I began to get into this, I had a frustration that I had carried over from youth and childhood. And that is that uh, people in the Christian faith are always using terms that are hard to understand, nebulous, intangible terms. Like, uh, give your heart. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, behold the lamb. Well, where is the lamb? Fall on the rock. How do you do that? Repent. I remember my first year in the ministry, we were over at the campgrounds getting ready for a camp meeting. And I uh, <clears throat> found an opportunity to talk to some of these preachers. This was the only time of the year they got any exercise, so after they got the first tent or two up, they'd stand behind the tents and talk. <clears throat> and I've picked out some godly preachers. I said to them, look, um, when someone says to you, how can I be saved, what do you tell them? They say, to repent. I said, oh, repent. Well, how do you do that? Well, they said, uh, the way you repent is to uh, just repent. <laughs> I said, you mean that the way to repent is to repent? Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> they could not make it clear. And one day in frustration, I decided I would uh, try and find the answers that were real, that were tangible. So I sat down with a book called Steps to Christ, which was supposed to be a classic on the subject of salvation. And I went through and I underlined everything in that book that it told me to do. And I ended up underlining almost the whole book. Amen. 
and it was full of the same phrases that these Christians were using, intangible phrases. And I was discouraged. I was on my way to the fireplace to throw it in the fire. But then I realized that in the process of seeking and searching for the answer, even though I didn't have the answer, something had happened within my life and my heart that I could not deny. So I decided to go through again the second time, and this time I'd underline everything it told me to do that I knew how to do, that was real, that was tangible. And to my surprise, there were only three things. Read the Bible, well, I can do that, whether it meant anything to me or not, I knew how to get started. Pray, well, that wasn't quite as real, but I had learned from mother's knee how to get started, so I put that down. And the third thing was to tell someone else what you got out of the first two. Read your Bible, pray, and witness, or serve. Now it got to be pretty simple. And I said to myself, well, that's pretty simple, but uh, you know, how much of it are you doing? So I began trying hard to do something about it. I began to read my Bible through again. I had done this I don't know how many years. And I had become an authority on the book of Genesis. <laughs> and if I got as far as Chronicles, that would finish me off for sure. <laughs> and then one day I was reading in Chronicles or Joshua, and uh, something said, oh, if you're trying to have a relationship with Jesus, why don't you go where he is best revealed? So I went to the Gospels, the New Testament, and began to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in a new version, New English Bible. It was good for me. And as I read, I began to find meaning in a personal, private, devotional life with God. And it made all the difference in the world. At first, it was hard work. At first, it was quite deliberate. I had to force myself to get into the reading of the Bible. I would rather read the Reader's Digest and other things. And then later, as I continued to seek him, I discovered that uh, my interest in other things began to fade away. And finally the cover stayed on the Reader's Digest. And I was interested in what I was reading and looking forward to it. Then I discovered something else. <clears throat> I uh, sometimes had a hard time waking up in time to spend time alone with Jesus. And I read about how Jesus was awakened by his father morning by morning. Isaiah 50. And so I said, if Jesus was awakened by his father, why couldn't I be awakened? Maybe they have a wake up call that's available. So I began to ask God to wake me up whenever he wanted me to meet him in that private time. And to my surprise, he woke me up at the exact time that I asked him to wake me up. Later, I left it up to him. Sometimes he'd wake me up in the middle of the night and I'd spend a thoughtful hour alone with him. Later, he would let me sleep in. That was nice too. And uh, it became a real plus in my life and I compared notes with other people and found out they're godly people who depend upon God to wake them up for the personal private time with him. I told about this at uh, Pacific Union College one time where I was pastor and it was a midweek meeting. There was a uh, <clears throat> professor there who said, oh, come on, Vendon, hey, you're going too far. Why did God invent alarm clocks? I said, I got news for you. God didn't invent alarm clocks. It was the devil. <clears throat> but I kind of had to back off and allow that uh, perhaps <clears throat> there are other methods, at least for those who uh, are able to do it. But I had discovered in college, I learned it in college, that the alarm clock is just like a lullaby to put you back to sleep again. And what you thought was important the night before is not important at all when you wake up with the alarm clock. Right? <laughs> well, God is very good and kind and patient with us as we uh, allow him to lead us in the Christian path and to know him better. 
I would like to conclude with this premise. A Christian is also someone who has been born again. John, the third chapter, makes this clear. Jesus and his discussion with Nicodemus. You can't even hope to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. My son is going to talk about this on Tuesday night. There, I told you who's going to preach. (laughs) And uh, I feel like I should do like my father and uncle used to do in their evangelistic meetings. They would get up and they'd promote the next meeting. They said, look, listen, if there is one meeting above all the rest of the meetings that you should be at, it's this one next Tuesday night. And they do this for every meeting. Well, I'm going to say it tonight. If there's one meeting you don't want to miss, it's this one. It's good. The subject of conversion has been a real problem for me because it's the most neglected topic in the Christian faith. And uh, I shared it with my son and he took it seriously. He went through his Bible and read the entire Bible looking for evidences of conversion and came back to me and shared his findings. And he's gonna do this Tuesday night. It's good, it's a classic. And I cannot wait to hear it myself again. Well, uh, can I know whether or not I've been converted? Yes, I can. I can know. There are indicators. One of them is my focus is on Jesus. My entire focus in life is on Jesus. A different direction. Another one is I have a daily experience with Christ. Luke 9, 23. If we will follow him, we need to take up our cross daily and follow him. Another one is, I have a deep interest in the Bible. John 5, 39 and 40. Jesus said to the people that at that time, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in doing that you'll have eternal life. But they are they that testify of me and you won't come to me that you might have life. So we search the scriptures if we've been born again. We have a meaningful prayer life. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. We have a desire to witness and we see God's purpose for the Christian witness. Mark 8, 35, he who tries to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel the same will save it. If my primary interest in being a Christian is to get myself to heaven, I probably won't be there. If my primary purpose for being a Christian is to share with someone else the good news, then I will be there along with them. I admit that I am a sinner. 1 John 1.8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I admit that I am a sinner. So sometimes I meet some of these good people who tell about how they haven't sinned in three years. And uh, that's their biggest sin right there. No, I admit that I am a sinner. The apostle Paul did. He said, I'm a chief sinner, even though he had been a Christian for 14 years. And we need God's grace on a daily basis. We have love for others. First John 4, 7 and 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And uh, instead of being among the crowds of people for whom the only good news is bad news about other people. We now have a love for other people. I heard a preacher say one time, it's too bad that the gospel is good news. If it was bad news, we'd be happy to pass it on and the work would be finished a long time ago. (laughs) No, we have a different attitude toward others. Romans 5 verse one, we have peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace. And finally, we don't sin anymore. (laughs) Really? Shall we leave that there? You'll find that before we're finished with this seminar, this is one of our major points. The problem of sin is not a problem of doing bad things. Sin is not the transgression of the law. Oh, someone says, that's what the Bible says. I was talking about this in the Philippines a while back and I can see a man down here sitting here. He said it out loud. That's what the Bible says. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that transgression of the law is the result of sin. Doing bad things 
Disobedience is the result of sin. Sin is living life apart from God. That's what sin is. Not having a relationship with God is what sin is all about, which results in the transgression of the law. And so the person, according to 1 John 3, 9, who has been born again, does not sin. His seed remaineth in him. And if you want a clue on that, you go to 1 Peter 1, 23, where we're told that the seed is the word of God. If the word of God remains in my life and I have time with God day by day, then I'm not sinning anymore, even though I might still be falling and failing in terms of the momentum of past mistakes. And the disciples learned that. They chose not to sin anymore except for one of them because they had found that they wanted to be with Jesus. They still fell and failed and uh, bickered about who was going to be the greatest. But they still didn't sin anymore because they were living life in relationship with Jesus. And you can choose that too. It's a doable, it is mission possible. Amen. And we can all be Christians if we're really interested. Just 
people said, Amen. Amen. I want to know Christ. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, how good of you to knock on our heart's door and ask for an entrance. We want to respond tonight by opening the door and saying, please come in. Come into our hearts. Come into our hearts. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. Come in to stay. Come in always. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. We want to know you more. And we pray that you would... uh, Dispatch all of the angels of heaven and the Holy Spirit to do their good work in our lives and our hearts, drawing us ever closer to Jesus. Enable us to press towards the goal, to march on, oh my soul. We want to know Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.